Welcome to Charged Up Studio Live, where small business owners get charged up for success. Are you a small business owner? Do you find yourself struggling through the many responsibilities that come with the title entrepreneur? Well, we're here for you. Charged Up Studio is hosted by Market Academy LLC, your prescription for what we call OPA. What is OPA? It's when you become so overwhelmed with the confusion that comes with business ownership that you become paralyzed and ultimately avoid doing anything in hopes it will take care of itself or you put it off till later. Does that sound familiar? I'm your host, Dan Olivo, and each week we bring a business professional eager to charge you up as they talk about the many things that keep you from moving forward with your small business. So are you ready to get charged up for success? Let's hit it. So welcome back once again to another episode of Charged Up Studio, where small business owners can get the information and tips needed to grow and scale their new businesses. I'm Dana Olivo, your host today. And today we're moving into the nonprofit arena as we welcome philanthropist, publisher, and marketing professional, David Dunworth. Now I've known David for many years. In fact, we've worked together in the nonprofit arena for several nonprofits across the nation. As a strategic philanthropist, David's mission is to enlighten individuals and groups about economic and social changes and the impact these changes may have on their lives. Today, we're going to talk about the difficult task of creating an environment that brings more love and acceptance to your nonprofit. So let's all give a special Charged Up Studio welcome to Mr. David Dunworth. Good morning, David. Good morning, Dana. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. No, I'm glad that you're here with us. Like I said, you know, we've known each other for quite a while. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and, but we haven't seen each other for a little bit. So this is nice. Well, other than, yeah, other than on Zoom, it's been, it's been Zoom a while. Zoom and C-Suite so. and all these other organizations that we're part right. of, but yeah. yeah. So if you've listened to Charged Up Studio, you know that I like kicking off the show with a question designed to help our listeners know you better. So okay. are you ready? As good as I'm going to get. <laughs> okay. So if you could go back in time and give your young self some, some solid advice, what advice would you give him and at what age? Well, I started out, let's see. I started out helping others when I was about 12 years old. And if I was to tell my 12 year old self about doing things, I would say, don't do it for yourself, do it for others. Yeah, you got a giving heart, but you're always looking for something on the other end. Just do it out of love and life will go so much easier. I then I personally wish I would have taken that advice when I was 12. But you know, when you get wrapped up and trapped up in business, sometimes the priorities look to the bottom line as opposed to how you're impacting others. And, you know, about 25 years ago, I made uh, a conscious decision to leave the uh, industry I was in, which I did a lot of giving. I worked mostly 12 to 14 hour days, but some of them were even longer. And I was in a uh, industry of service, but my motives were more ulterior than they were um, heartfelt. I was in the high end uh, hospitality industry. And so anybody who's ever been a waiter, a waitress, bartender, bus boy, dishwasher, anything in there, you know that you're serving other people through your actions. And I gave all of that up and started working with nonprofits and ministries and uh, businesses as a coach, as an advisor, and uh, helped them with their marketing too, from a 
giving perspective. Right. Sorry right. about the background. No, I thought that was me. <laughs> I thought that was me. I thought it was something out on the patio or something. So don't worry about it. You know, I noticed that you have Center Vision up in the in the corner, and that's one of the organizations that we have worked together on. Um, Hugh Hugh Ballou is just, um, you know, he is just a master when it comes to strategic planning for nonprofits. So, are you retired right now, or are you still working, or is well, this all a what is it? <laughs> yeah, I. Uh... I'll tell you how the transformation happened, and we'll get to Hugh and Center Vision in just a second. But in February of 2020, you know, when the COVID scare was just coming to America, I was out in California and I was in a hotel where meetings were all day. They were out in the, the big expansive lobby or in private rooms. Our meetings were there, our meals were there. We never left the building. And in the hotel, which was very, very large, uh, there was a lot, uh, a large congregation of Chinese or Asian people, and they all had masks on. And we looked at each other and said, yeah, I know that there's something going on, but this is taking it to extremes, isn't it? Well, getting on the plane at the end of that week, I started feeling bad. And by... The end of the weekend, I was in bed and I stayed in bed for till the middle of May. And I had gone to the hospital and the hospitals wouldn't accept me because they didn't really know the protocol or what to do, whatever. So they sent me home and said, take care of yourself, do the best you can. Well, I thought I was gonna die. I was so sick. And I've been sick before. I've had pneumonia, you know, all that kind of stuff. But there was nothing like this sickness. And I was you know, alone. I live alone for most, uh, if not all the year. And I had a lot of time to think and pray. I couldn't support my clients. So I passed on. Them. I said, you know, you're going to have to find somebody else because I can't support you. And so I gave up all my clients, closed my marketing agency. And uh, the Lord put it on my heart that I needed to stop climbing the corporate ladder. Yeah, you got it. You're, you're doing great, but you got the ladder on the wrong building. So start working for others full time and the money will take care of itself. So that's what I decided to do. I started working with ministries, foundations, nonprofits, and I had already started a uh, relationship with an NGO in Uganda. And so I said, you know, for the next while, I'm going to work pro bono with organizations so that I can help other people full time. Right. And I've been doing it ever since. So I'm right. not really retired. I work just well, as hard not, as I ever have. I'm not retired. OK, for, it's for different purposes. Yeah. And that's understandable. You know, that's understandable, you know. Um, but um, yeah, and, I mean, like I said, like you said, you know, the money will come. Is the money coming? <laughs> and if it is, that's that's excellent. You know, if it's not, then um, how are you, how can you support yourself if you've got nothing coming in? Well, you know, I I live off of what I have, and I live fairly well. If you can see by the size of me, I haven't missed any meals, and uh, you know, I'm doing great. I have a lovely place to live. It's fully paid for. Um, I'm just so, taking care of the yeah. things that are have become most important to me and right. that's in helping other people. Right, right. And that's important that you brought that up because a lot of nonprofits um, that start up, they're, they're generally started by individuals because they have a passion, but they don't have the means to make it work. Okay. And so right. therefore they're, they're spending all their time spinning their wheels, um, trying to attract the uh, momentum that they need for their nonprofit. So let's talk right. a little bit about how we can um, help these small 
these nonprofits, smaller nonprofits, strategically um, start out on a, a foothold that's going to grow that business? Sure, sure. Um, it starts at the founder level. And small nonprofits struggle because they don't have the resources to accomplish their mission. They don't have the ability to, to build capacity or sustainability. And so they are always chasing the next donor. And while that's how a lot of money comes in, they're writing grants, they're doing this, but they're meeting with people looking for that next donor. There's, therein is the Achilles heel. Yeah. You see, because if they're always out chasing donors, they're not taking care of the donors that they have. Exactly. And that's the key. That's the key is to be mindful of those people and why they give, why they're active, if they're sitting on your board, if they're being a volunteer, whatever they're doing, you need to give them love. You need to right. treat them with respect, with recognition, be loyal to them, and they'll be loyal to you. What most foundations and nonprofits find is that they they don't focus enough on the end goal which is donor and customer and volunteer loyalty and people need to feel that they're being valued they need to feel that they mean something other than of being a checkbook and you know the more you pay attention to them, like your board, like your, your main donors, even the little occasional donors, the more love you can share with them. And I don't mean the mushy kind of love. I mean the, the love where you give them respect, you treat them with dignity, you treat them um, not as an object, but as a living, breathing human being. And, you know, in business in general, there's a, there's a, a well-spoken, um, little uh, saying that people don't leave organizations, they leave management. Their manager doesn't treat them the way they want. They don't take, they're taken for granted. They're, they're not recognized often enough. They're ostracized when things don't go right. Well, people are human. People yeah. make mistakes. And we have to recognize that, that nobody, not even the boss is perfect. And so by shifting from a let's work uh, on this project to let's work together to find commonality, to kind to grow our relationships and be productive at the same time is a big, big difference in how nonprofits and regular businesses work. Right. Right. No, definitely. You know, and this is one of the things, you know, as you and I have worked over the years, um, you know, our specialties, you know, and things like that, that we work with. And one of the things that I primarily concentrate on is that donor side of things and creating those relationships and stuff like that. In fact, one of the courses that I offer through Market Atomy is a course that's called uh, Building a Donor Strategy That Pays. Exactly. Uh, because, right. A lot of these nonprofits, especially the smaller nonprofits, you know, um, they're they're chasing these bigger dollars that come with grants and things like that. And what they don't understand, first of all, is a lot of these grants and these this money that you can get federally or by the state or wherever you can get it, it does not cover administrative costs. It just covers clinical costs or whatever is involved in there. Your donors are the ones who are going to pay the utility bills, pay the rent, et cetera, all of that. And if you, like you said, if you can't treat those donors and show appreciation and love, even if it's $5 a month that they're, they're sending you or whatever, they need to know that you recognize that. But at the same time, they need to know what their money is doing. You've, you've hit on a very, very pertinent, pertinent uh, part that a lot of small nonprofits don't really catch on to early enough. And, you know, statistically, um, my work with Center Vision started, oh, I've known Hugh Ballou 
almost 14 years now. We started working together occasionally several years back. I've been uh, as the chairman of the board of directors for Center Vision for going on my third year, but he and I work together uh, and I work as purely as a volunteer um, and donate and dedicate my time to our cause because we teach nonprofit leaders how to create a transformation playbook to go from how they are to how they want to be. And so by focusing on love in the organization, that means you're recognizing that board member, that donor, you're paying attention to them, you're making them feel special and you're keeping them informed of how their money is being utilized. That's what, that's the big uh, frailty in right. small organizations. Right. So yeah, right. We, 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 we focus on that quite a bit. So let's talk a little bit about um, the strategy involved in that transformational change. The strategy begins early on, but let's say you're you're starting out as a as a new nonprofit. You've got your mission, your vision. You know what your uh, mission is. You're seeking board members to help support you and get things off the ground. Well, oftentimes we pick the people that we think are going to be valuable to us as opposed to how much value you can bring to that person. And, uh, and before you go on, sure. let's talk a little bit about what is the responsibility of board member, of a board member? What are their responsibilities? Well, their responsibilities are to uh, counsel and advise the right direction that the board should uh, and the nonprofit should focus on so that they run, they set that narrow set of tracks down the road and the train of the nonprofit, it begins to roll. And as it picks up speed, we come upon things that may cause division or uh, oh, shiny object syndrome, or let's expand and do this. This is a great cause rather than sticking to their mission. So the board's position is to guide, help and build that, that uh, impetus to be begin to fulfill your mission. And oftentimes the wrong board members are chosen. When you think that, oh, this will be great. They, more people wanna be a checkbook or a, oh, this will look good on my resume. Yeah. As opposed to, I have a heart that longs to, to fulfill the passion that you're asking me about. And that's the key to the whole thing is finding the right board member rather than a board member. Well, and, and, it takes and time. One, yeah, and one of the things that Hugh has, you know, reinforced or beaten into us is the fact that a board member's job is also to raise the funds and create exactly. awareness for the, so that's their primary job. And if they can't fulfill those obligations, then you know it's time to find another board member because right and yeah i'm sorry yeah no go ahead go ahead uh and you know in finding that right board member who's got the heart they're going to do what they can to grow the organization like you said yeah their their responsibility is to is to raise money or to uh bring in the right people to uh, help with the projects and grow the organization on a sound financial footprint. Now, a lot of nonprofits require their board to have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. I sit on a board and uh, I sit on the center vision board and I pay every month. I send my contribution mm -hmm. in um, just to help sustain the, the work that we do. And I sit on another board and it's the same thing. I, I won't sit on a board if they're just looking for somebody with their name that they can put on right. their stationery. Right. I just won't do it. I and have to have my, my heart and passion in there. Right. So my time, my talent, and my treasure are important yeah. that they go to the right places. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So how can a board of directors 
uh, bring about more love for an organization? By doing the things that they're a right to do. You know, we do things for ulterior motives. We do things because they think it'll be a good thing. Uh, but treating others with respect and dignity is a biblical uh, commandment, really. Yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. And would you treat your mother the same way you just treated that volunteer? Mm -hmm. You know, if they, if they didn't um, show the respect and dignity of what that person is trying to do. So board members really need to respect each other, have dignity, share dignity, share um, outreach, share the message, and do it all in a high standard consistently. Because if their name is attached to it, if they do something wrong, if you've got the wrong board member in there who ends up having a problem that ends up in the media, that tarnishes your organization right. as well. Same thing with a volunteer, same thing with an employee, that they are the representatives of your organization. So best behavior, genuine love, if you will, is a great uh, foundation for any organization, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit business, even a volunteer or, or a fraternal organization. There has to be the more love in there, the better off you're going to be. Right, right. Well, and you look at some of these larger nonprofits, you know, Red Cross, you know, uh, 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 what is it, Komen for breast cancer awareness, right, and things right. like that. Now, they've got the funds behind them. They can produce these very heartwarming, you know, videos and, and promotions and things like that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how the smaller organizations, nonprofits, can produce something or get the message out there of what they're all about and showing that love that's sure. going to attract donors. Here is something that is super simple, super simple, and it's just the basic. Uh, we can grow from there in a second. But you know everybody in your organization, you know, if you have any data at all, what their special days are, whether it's a birthday or a an uh, wedding anniversary or birth of a grandchild or whatever. Why not take 20 seconds? And I just learned this recently. I thought it was beautiful, Jim. Mm -hmm. Take 20 seconds and create a video wishing them a happy birthday. Doesn't have to be long, doesn't have to be in, personally. Uh, in fact, uh, you put a little birthday cap on or have a, you know, a cake in front of you and just wish them a happy birthday or a wedding anniversary or God bless the child. You know, handwritten notes are another thing. Keeping people in communication so that they never forget who you are, what you're doing. Uh, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be throwing an annual gala where you can showcase the board and the board chairman or whatever it doesn't have to be although it can grow to that yes uh, but the little things i produce a 30 page news we don't call it a newsletter uh hugh doesn't like that that name but we call it updates and every month on the uh, first tuesday of the month it goes out to everybody it goes out we have 205,000 connections on social media and everybody that's in our database, which is several thousand uh, that we communicate with regularly, receives that. And it tells them what's going on, gives them some information, gives them a couple of jokes, things to keep it light. And it's just another vehicle that we use to get our message out, to be, be stay in the public eye, stay in the donor's eye, and go from there. But it, it can start out with a 20-second happy birthday video or whatever you're, uh, yeah. you, know, you're, you can imagine. A weekly email every Friday saying, hey, this is what we did. Uh, we got in $4,000 and we spent 5,400 on you know, the advancement of our service or whatever, just to keep them informed to let them know what's going on and how much you value them. Well, and there there are a lot of products out there, you know, that are very inexpensive, even for sending handwritten notes, you know, you don't have to handwrite them, 
you know, and they're all digital. What do you think, um, do you think that the introduction of AI is going to help the nonprofit arena as far as streamlining processes and things like that? Because I know as far as my business is concerned, it's helped tremendously on my on streamlining processes. And yeah, I think AI is going to become very valuable as it uh, matures. It's evolving rather quickly. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not an advocate of using them to write copy. I'm a certified master copywriter, direct response. So, you know, I kind of take so that, chat part, G- that part. Chat GPT is out for you. That, well, not completely because yeah. it, it's very, very useful to, like you said, to develop processes, procedures, outlines for what you're trying to do, deliverables that you can uh, work towards and hold your board members accountable and uh, volunteers and staff and that sort of thing. Uh, it can write basic emails and yeah, you can do all of that pre-advanced scheduling and put automation into it, which will relieve a lot of the manual work right. that has to be done. But I always recommend that if somebody's going to send uh, something in the mail, even if it's a form, even if it's a pre-printed thing, is to scratch out a little handwritten note you know, it could be just, hi, thinking of you, uh, hope you're doing well, you know, on that on that document so that they know that you actually paid attention to it, that it's not just something that's been kicked out of a machine automatically. So let's talk Personal just touch. quickly. Yeah, let's just talk quickly about volunteers. What are they looking at? Uh, what are their expectations or... Um, their expectations when working with a nonprofit? Well, volunteers do that for one specific reason. Is that they, have, they have feelings. They have a heart for whatever that mission might be. It could be feeding the homeless. It could be, um, you know, clothing the naked. It could be any of those needs that humanity has that we can do to help others. And so treating them as valuable as possible is important because they can they can serve any number of nonprofits, but they've chosen yours. And so making them feel special, just like a board member, there right. is every bit as important because they're a critical element and they're on the front line. Right. Uh, if I could share a story with you, it'll kind of give you um, a little bit of a, an example of what injecting love into an organization and the very end, at the very beginning would be. In 2018, I was work, working with a, a client in India. We went to Hyderabad, India, and we were there for six weeks. And he was building a, a software program for nonprofits. And so we met with a lot of NGOs there. We met with the uh, Red Cross, we met with universities, we met with uh, different organizations of, of large and small sizes. And we also met with the chancellor of, and bear with me, the, for his, the name is a little difficult, Jararalal Nehru Technical University. Now JNTU is the largest university in India. And it's got satellite campuses all across the, the country. And we asked the chancellor if he would do an experiment with us. You see, students in India work really, really hard to get advanced, to get an opportunity to work because their families are counting on them to get a good job, to get a good income so that they can help with the family. Poverty in India is rampant. And so these kids are under pressure, not only from their parents, but from the schools and the possibility of employment um, for years growing up. So their social skills are quite limited. And we asked the, the chancellor if he would let us do an experiment with all of the NGOs that we were working with. If we could ask a group of students who were juniors and seniors in college, if they would volunteer 
four hours a week for six weeks with uh, an NGO in doing social work, if you will, we'll call it social work. Uh, we call it service. Um, and we got about 20, 24 students who agreed to that. And we lined them up with nonprofits, with the NGOs. And they went to different ones. We used six different NGOs. And every two weeks, we rotated these people. And the reason why we did it was to have them force the children, the uh, young adults, to interact not only with the leadership of the NGO, but also with the, the base that they're serving. It could have been, uh, you know, educating in the slums, uh, feeding the hungry, even remote medical, what we arranged up with a, a one group. And so they were evaluated not only by the leadership of the NGO, but also with the professors that they were working with and see if that transformation made any difference. Now you see in Hyderabad, there's Deloitte, which is a humongous employer yeah. there. And yeah. there's Tata, which is another conglomerate that was uh, constructed by one man. And they're into everything. They're building automobiles, infrastructure, you name it, they're doing. And so they were not hiring these students because they had no ability to communicate. They were so shy and so introverted that they were not getting those jobs. And so that's why it appealed to the chancellor to do this experiment. And after six weeks, the transformation was so remarkable, we had hires come. Uh, they even hired a junior who was who far excelled uh, in that. And Deloitte Touche hired that person, even as a junior, and put them on a small retainer and monthly stipend just to get them so that then when they graduated, they would be their employer, right. employee. So injecting love at any place has great, great benefits. Did it cost us anything? No. Did it cost the university anything? No. Did it cost the student anything? Nothing but their time. But what they gained from it, what Deloitte gained from it, what Tata gained from it, what the school came for it were transformed individuals. And now JNTU has accepted that into their uh, curriculum. And that is an ongoing process, which you know, started out as a simple experiment to see if it yeah. would work. So volunteers can do that. I mean, uh, nonprofits can do that with their volunteers. Right. They want to find those shy, introverted people and let them blossom. Yep. Yep. So one last question before sure. we uh, start to close out the show. Um, you, uh, in the entry or the opening, we talked about social and economic changes that are happening around us. And one of the things I've noticed as the younger generation is growing that, and the baby boomers and those are starting to dwindle. Are you seeing more and more of these Gen Xers, Gen Ys, Gen Zs or whatever, seeing them as, as you said before, uh, putting themselves and adopting a position within the nonprofit arena to where their, you know, their focus is more than what's for them, but what's for the universe or for the general public. Do you see that? We see that in, in segments of the economy. We see that um, nonprofits are still, the volunteer base, the staff base are generally older people, not necessarily um, senior citizens, the boomers like me, um, but we, you know, we're seeing middle age people, uh, people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. The people in the Gen Xers and Gen Ys and and so forth are becoming active in environmental issues more so than humanitarian, I'll call it. Although there are many, don't, don't misunderstand me, there are many, but the overwhelming uh, amount of youth in social causes are about climate change, greenhouse gases, um, pollution, those types of things. And it's great to see that because, you know, 
we need all of those things. Uh, but I would encourage nonprofits to seek out those who may have a heart to do something, but aren't sure where to go and to seek them out and bring them in just like we did at JNTU and, right. and help them grow themselves into the people that they want to be um, to make that a reality. Yes. No, that's something I've noticed, too, is their determination to make change um, as far as that's concerned. So, right. so we're coming up on the end of another episode of Charged Up Studio. And David, do you have any last minute tips you want to leave our audience with? Well, I'd like to leave them with uh, a, a quote out of a book that uh, kind of spells it out. Uh, this is a book by... Uh, Steve Farber, who is a motivational speaker and has been on the circuit. I know years. Steve. Yes. Oh, do you? Okay. Uh -huh. Well, his his latest book is Love is Just Good Business. And here's an excerpt from it that I think hits home. Love is not only appropriate in the context of business, it's the foundation of great leadership and therefore the very foundation of a thriving competitive enterprise. When love is part of an organization's framework and operationalized in its culture, employees and customers feel genuinely valued. Employees who are passionate about the work that they do are more loyal, innovative, creative, and inspired. And that translates to great customer experience. They don't serve others out of obligation, but because of a genuine desire to improve people's lives. And when customers reciprocate by loving their products, their services, and their people, that's when something great happens. That's when you get loyalty. That's when you get raving fans. And it's refreshingly- That, sounds like, that, that sounds like Steve. <laughs> Isn't it great? Yeah, I met Steve years it ago. Is. And uh, have followed him. Have you, ever, have you ever heard him play his guitar? No, he uh, he talks he's, about giving it up, but I know he still plays on the side. Oh, yeah. He still plays it. And he's good. He's good. Yeah. So that concludes our podcast for today. And please leave a review on any of our stream of the streaming platforms you're listening to us on or go to Charged Up Studios Facebook page and leave a review there. Charged Up Studio is the product of marketatomy.com the e and marketatomy.academy, the e-learning environment designed specifically for micro-business owners and in the, with micro-business owners in mind. For more information and to register for our many courses, go to marketatomy.academy. Once again, thank you, David, for joining us today. It's my pleasure. It's been great. Thank you so much for sharing uh, my message to the world, and I hope it helps your organization as well. And it's always been a pleasure working with you, and I hope that continues for years to come. Oh, yes, definitely. So that's it for another episode. Uh, I hope to see everybody back next week where we'll have another exciting guest for you um, on Charged Up Studio. Talk to you later. Bye. You've been listening to Charged Up Studio Live, the podcast with you, the small business owner in mind, with your host, Dana Olivo. Join us every Tuesday as we bring you valuable tips and insights into many of the topics you don't know you don't know about growing a successful business. Please leave us a review on any of the streaming platforms you are listening to or visit us on the YouTube or Facebook page and leave a review or subscribe so you don't miss another episode. You can also support us through Patreon by visiting our website, chargedupstudio.live and click on the Patreon link. Until next week, go out and have a charged up week.